So hello everybody and welcome to our next uh, You Saw Me webinar. Um, it's a real pleasure to have a, a very, um, yeah, very interesting topic today, a topic which I personally like a lot because uh, I've been working on that field uh, um, in the past years. So today with me, I have uh, Pinar Yilmaz, uh, which some of you certainly know um, from our young club. And we have Pavel Paczewski, I hope I said that correctly, uh, who is right. the founder and CEO of uh, a company, Upmedic, which is... Um, yeah, working on the field of structured reporting. And so today's topic is uh, structured reporting, the meeting point of artificial and human intelligence in radiology. And I think that's a very interesting topic to talk about. And um, please, everybody, if there's any questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A and to the chat. And uh, yeah, without much further ado, I'd say, Pavel, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, for the introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this beautiful evening uh, and i promise the topic will be as beautiful as the evening of the, today uh, in fact uh, it is this topic is so beautiful that we, it, it, in this topic meet two very strong forces uh, yes we we have uh, first of all human intelligence and another intelligence which is uh, by computer uh, realized by computers uh, but uh, before moving on to the lecture, I'll tell you a bit about myself. I'm a computer scientist, so I have this technical background, but I work a lot with, uh, with clinicians, with radiologists. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as a result of my collaboration with them, I co-founded a startup, AppMedic, that focuses on creating a reporting system that combines benefits of uh, structured reporting and freeform dictation. I'm also an advocate uh, for using uh, SNOMED City in clinical settings, uh, but with the human factor in mind. And I will uh, try to um, stress this human factor in mind uh, through the whole lecture. Actually, we'll start uh, with the, one of the most human uh, fields of knowledge with, uh, with short uh, one slide philosophy course. Uh, there are two. A very interesting, very important uh, from the perspective of human philosophy topics. Uh, first of all, is dialectics, and uh, the other one is class struggle. I will, I will, uh, I promise, I will explain why it is uh, related to our field. Uh, but let me let me just uh, quickly refresh the knowledge about this. So there was a philosopher uh, called Hegel, who had the idea that the whole humanity um in, in through, through the whole history always invented something using a schema that he kind of observed kind, kind of distilled from from the history of humanity and hegel um, saw and uh, described that all of the human ideas uh, are introduced uh, to to be used uh, in in a form of first of all thesis which is a new concept that someone invents but when this concept is invented or discovered, there, is, there exists also another one called antithesis, which is almost completely opposite to, to it. But those two concepts, strictly uh, opposite, uh, uh, are, being, uh, are being executed and are being compared, and humanity finds strong strengths of, of each of them and eventually they merge and then they form synthesis and this synthesis is uh, the starting point for another uh, thesis and antithesis uh, pair and, and this happens uh, in a loop so whole and the whole humanity invented all ideas in this form this is what hegel distilled from human history and marx uh, probably known by everyone uh, kind of applied this concept of uh, dialectic of, uh, from Hegel to society. And he kind of defined that there are two classes. One of them is poorer, one of them is uh, richer, and they have like embedded conflict between each other. So they fight, they have uh, different opinions on the, on the, about the reality. Uh, even though they both uh, are of the, from the same species. And uh, with the development of capitalism, the class struggle 
takes an acute for form uh, by the Marx uh, uh, thoughts. So this is like the, the, our, the end of our uh, one slide philosophy course. Let's move on the, to the hospital setting. And we can find not a class struggle, but a clinical struggle. Um, you, you, I first, I'll start with those images. Those images of Hegel and Marx were actually generated not by an artist. Uh, they were generated by neural uh, networks, which can generate text uh, images out of uh, text. You can type any kind of uh, text input. You can type anything you can imagine. And this network kind of understands the, our reality is trained on the contents of the whole internet and can merge sometimes very, very strange concepts. Yes, I, I created doctors out of uh, two famous philosophers, but uh, we can, as humanity, as uh, the new neural networks, generate something new out of concepts that we understand. But for the clinical struggle concept, we can find uh, to uh, this pair of, of, two, of two concepts, thesis and antithesis, and I will define them related to the topic of the lecture. So we, first of all, there's thesis, and it uh, sounds like this, we can automate healthcare, and there are many stakeholders that really want this to happen right now. We have governments who have their reasons to automate healthcare. I will describe it later in details, but also we have IT people who also have some ideas to automate healthcare. On the uh, opposite side, we have uh, the antithesis, which is human intelligence is irreplaceable by computers. And probably uh, you might find uh, doctors, clinicians who are for this, uh, this sentence, for this motion. Also patients because of the human factor that they kind of require from doctors when, uh, when the appointment is on. Um, but uh, paraphrasing uh, Marx further, we can state also that with the development of AI, the clinical struggles takes an acute form because, because of the um, differences between human and artificial intelligence that are now being shown to us and uh, I, will, I will be showing examples of it later. And one question that will be um, for us for, for later, what is the synthesis of these two? But you can also find spoilers for it uh, in the title of the lecture. So let's move on. Uh, we can, uh, so yes, we, we have this uh, thesis and actually governments do not state that we can automate healthcare, but we must automate healthcare. And these are arguments for it. First of all, there is the, the situation of aging population. Actually, the proportion of the world's population over 60 years of age will be 22% by 2050, which is nearly double of that of 2015. And these are statistics from WHO. But also, as population gets older, it also requires more imaging. So there is this demand for imaging that is growing. Also, it is growing at such pace that we, are, uh, we, we cannot uh, keep up with training new radiologists, new, new clinicians to, to satisfy the demand. Also, uh, from the economical perspective, governments lose a lot of money because of the time that is being lost on, for, in, for instance, patients who have to take temporary leaves from their jobs waiting for imaging diagnosis. And uh, this can be um, hu huge amounts in, in billions of dollars per country, which is globally a huge problem. And also from, from the IT perspective, um, there is this belief that uh, we can, we, we think we can automate uh, healthcare. At least we hope we can automate healthcare. And these are some examples uh, how we can automate healthcare. Uh, most of the, this, this graph shows uh, the number of FDA approvals related to artificial intelligence and machine learning devices. 
and they are categorized by the field in which they are being specialized. As you can see, most of them are related to radiology, but uh, also some of them are related to cardiovascular. Mm, but but the big major majority is focused on radiology right now. I will tell you why later. But we can look into examples of, of such solutions. Uh, these are for, for radiology, actually. So we can automate diagnosing, observing, finding, extracting things from images. Uh, for instance, uh, finding intracranial hemorrhage. We can also find uh, large vessel occlusions. And this is being done automatically. So simple very strictly defined decisions that are being made on medical images can be automated, uh, but also not from uh, strictly from radiology, but uh, from ophthalmology. You can, for instance, uh, find solutions uh, that automate reporting uh, for vision threatening diabetic retinopathy, which also take the image, perform a lot of calculations, uh, those solutions are being trained to, to exactly extract from the image what they were trained to, and then having that structured data taken from signal, because images can be treated as signals, which can be something really unstructured, they distill the information that we require from them. And we train those solutions to do exactly one thing. Uh, you may ask uh, why almost all examples of automation relate to the imaging. And this is something that comes from computer science, actually. The computer scientists designed uh, the right tool for, for image analysis. And we uh, nowadays are pretty sure that it works. This tool is called convolution neural networks, which, which are kind of special, special kind, kind of neural networks that uh, perform special kind of operation on the images, but they are very good at recognizing patterns in images, something that uh, we used to believe that only human beings uh, can do. And those neural networks were already applied to different fields, uh, for instance, um, autonomous vehicles, and uh, or, or in factories to recognize some very simple things. But we, we have the know-how, how to use the, those neural networks and to uh, apply them to clinical expectations. Also, uh, we train uh, solutions on images because they kind of, there is this assumption that they are kind of uh, location independent. Something that is being recognized in the image doesn't have to know about human language. We do not need any kind of text recognition. We do not have any, uh, we do not have to have any uh, translation happening because a, 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 an image taken uh, at every, any location can be recognized. Of course, there are uh, problems related to different pieces of equipment, but having the same piece of equipment in different locations, we might assume that they, they, because of uh, human species, we can extract the similar information from the image. The recipe for good um, artificial intelligence model that extracts information from image is that we need a lot of data. And uh, those data points uh, ma must be not only numerous, but also uh, diverse. We do not, uh, we, we can't have pictures of a single patient. We, we need pictures that have some differences that, are, that we can train our solution to, to also recognize in different uh, new, um, new uh, training samples. Because first of all, we train the solution and it kind of learns the nature of the problem. And the more diverse examples we have, the, the, the deeper it can get to the nature of the problem. And uh, after we train the solution, after we stay, state that, okay, this is good enough because uh, those solutions cannot be perfect because there, are all, there is always some signal that is introducing error. We state, okay, this is good enough. We might deploy it. We might use it in everyday practice. 
but the, the, the number of examples must, must be enough and also the diversity of all those examples. Uh, also, uh, having said that, we should state that uh, imaging is not the only part of the clinical workflow that can be automated, but it was kind of the simplest uh, uh, part of it. Uh, why, why it was simpler than, for instance, uh, mine, data mining in uh, EHR is because of, for instance, uh, siloing data within uh, software solutions by different vendors. So they kind of protect the data not to be shared, not to be used for training. But also, uh, so this is more like a political thing, but also because of the um process around uh, medical documentation and uh, we store a lot of data about patients a lot textual data about patients like things like their weight their uh, like the size of different organs also some observations that are being phrased by by clinicians uh, in the form of clinical notes or uh, diagnostic reports but the problems uh, with them are that they are often incomplete, also unstructured and ambiguous because each doctor has their own style of writing. And when ambiguity is present, computers always have problems with, with those uh, topics. So it is difficult for us to train those solutions. But we can, uh, if assuming that we can kind of have good medical documentation in a structured form, so then this is the form of documentation that is easier to understand by computers. We can uh, no, no, we no longer have to use, for instance, text searching. So we look for occurrence of a strict phrase within a big data set. We kind of then focus on the meaning of the phrases. So the synonyms uh, for, for a phrase can be found. We can build upon this foundation of when we have good documentation in a structure form, we can, and uh, with help of uh, clinicians, we can design some uh, deterministic rules or maybe probabilistic, it depends on the assumptions, but we can define those rules. And those rules are kind of guidelines, what to do in a given situation. Most of those guidelines are being applied right now uh, but more um, manually, but having documentation in a proper form, we are able to automate also this part of uh, clinical workflow to, of course, extend to, 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 the, to the, like the step of, uh, depending on the, the structure that we collect about patient. And the problem with this approach is that documentation relies on uh, human intelligence and the process of creating it. And uh, moving on, and uh, we will be looking for, for the solution to the process around um, medical documentation. But first of all, uh, let's uh, think uh, whether AI models always diagnose what we expect. Actually, uh, there is a situ the situation coming from the time of uh, COVID pandemic two years ago. Uh, when, when the pandemic started, um, doctors, uh, clinicians, the radiologists had ideas for diagnosing uh, lungs and assessing the person, like how serious effects of COVID were for lungs. And some of them to, uh, to make more documentation more objective, um, designed scales. Some of them had scales that were from zero to five, but others had, scale, had de de defined scales that are from zero to 25 and so on and so forth, which is uh, actually a, a normal thing in medicine. When, er when there is a new problem, there are a lot of ideas that are being clashed, like those uh, thesis and antithesis, uh, and they are being uh, clashed and uh, together and uh, medical world then decides which approach is the best. Sometimes this decision is being take, then taken, uh, made automatically in a form, or, in a form of number of citations that are being 
uh, done by, by different uh, researchers. But eventually we kind of can assume that uh, the, 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 uh, eventually there is only a single scale. Uh, in the case of COVID, there was a different situation because uh, the doctors started to de derive those scales, but also there was a rush from IT people, uh, companies who wanted to automate uh, diagnostics of COVID, but they didn't have the full understanding of COVID the, and how to, how to scale, how to measure the, the effects of it, because there was no scale uh, that uh, medical world um, derived. So, uh, so the, the solutions that were devised um, during COVID have problems of different defining the effects of, of COVID on lungs, for instance. So we, even though we automated some of parts of the diagnostics uh, for COVID, we have problems with uh, comparing results of those solutions. This, is, uh, this problem is called hardwiring chaos because we, we do not know what we diagnose, uh, but we all already automate, uh, automate it. And we then stay with the problems of not having the problem properly defined. And so this is related to uh, training models too fast, but also we can train models uh, at the proper time, but on bad data. And uh, maybe actually those data sets can be treated as good because, uh, for instance, NI, uh, NIH uh, full chest uh, X-rays uh, data set uh, has uh, people like scientists ha have decided that it is a good data set but measuring like the, the quality of it we can state that it has 90 percent accuracy so we have uh, still 10 percent uh, to be better uh, we, we could correct it but uh, this data set it can can be used by different manufacturers to, to, to train your solution on and, but when you train those solutions, uh, we also embed errors from this data set into the, the solution that we are devising. So we need to find the, the proper point in time to, to create our automation and proper data that we want to uh, uh, train on. Because when we train a neural network, we then have no way of understanding why it took such a decision because we can treat it as black box that we feed with image. So this is input for the neural network. And we can expect that it will, be, it will have an output and it will have a decision of, of, in a form that we trained it for, but we won't be able to explain why, uh, why the neural network decided in this way. This is because of the like the, the, the contents, the, this, the, the architecture of those neural networks. They do not have concepts like lungs, like organs. All they do uh, actually is matrix multiplication and uh, they are neural networks are big, big matrices that contain numbers in them. And by multiplying different matrices, uh, matrices uh, we, we eventually obtain the decision that we expect our neural network to make. But uh, coming back to the human intelligence uh, that uh, is irreplaceable by computers, actually, we might look for examples that uh, we cannot uh, replace humans uh, by computers. And uh, coming to the nature of uh, neural networks, and um, neural networks are very good at diagnosing common health problems because we need, need to have so many examples of them and they might have to be of good quality. But uh, there are so many different uh, pathologies, so many different symptoms that could be uh, recognized, but we have too few examples of them to train a, 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 an artificial uh, neural network. So this is probably the place where human intelligence will stay with us for, for, well, for long. But also there is this human factor related to patients. Uh, because even though we can present patients with a questionnaire, 
that has very well stated questions, we, uh, we cannot be sure that uh, it is fully understood by them. And uh, this is a place for, for the human factor, for the clinician to, to be there, to, to ask follow-up questions, to clarify things that could be problematic for the patient. Um, but having performed all the medical examinations, uh, like uh, all of the diagnostics, if we have uh, problems with, related to incomplete clinical notes, then there is uh, no, no use uh, for artificial intelligence uh, to analyze them. But also there are problems for humans because if there is no information stored in medical documentation, we cannot uh, go back in time and, to, and examine ourselves what happened during that uh, medical procedure. So the clinical notes, when they are complete, we have a strong foundation both for human beings to, to help patients better, uh, but also for, for the artificial intelligence to automate tasks that are mundane and difficult and time-consuming time from, the, from the doctor's perspective. There is this uh, common rule for artificial intelligence that when we feed a neural network with garbage, uh, as, as input, garbage in, we re will receive garbage uh, on the output. So we have garbage out. And this is true for any problem that we have uh, right now in, in any setting, whether it's clinical or not. And actually, there is a solution that uh, kind of merges the good, uh, the, the strengths of human intelligence and our artificial intelligence. And it's, quite, and it's quite an old solution because it was uh, the first uh, approaches to structured reporting uh, can be found in 1980s. And these were kind of complex systems that guided doctors, guided clinicians where, when they were creating documentation, but they had problems uh, with adoption. So um, we had to wait much longer um, to, for them to, to, adopt, to be, become more popular. But let's first of all define what structured reporting is. Uh, it is a method of clinical documentation that captures and displays specific data elements in specific format. So then so software solution might help doctors with creating medical documentation in a very precise way. Um, we might ask how precise must, must, must be the, the software. And actually there are different uh, like levels of structure that we might impose on medical documentation. And uh, we, we might be very simplistic in the, in the structured reporting approach. And we might simply structure only the, the sections in the report. And already this information tells us a lot about which part of the text uh, is related to which uh, part of the, the document, for instance, clinical information, or for instance, comparison study, or where we can uh, look for findings in the report. But this is like the first uh, level of, um, of structuring uh, documentation. We can go deeper and we can also structure uh, the reporting at the level of uh, for some single phrases. And then we do not only have uh, sections that are defined, we also have phrases, set of phrases that are being suggested to, to the clinician. So they might simply pick from, from a predefined set uh, in a very standardized form, what, what they see in the image and what they want to state in the final report. Uh, of course, there are problems with this uh, approach because doctors, uh, clinicians, radiologists uh, using structured reporting have problems like uh, the, uh, increased eyes of time, which means that they spend more time on the uh, second monitor looking for phrases that are adhering to the contents of the image they analyze, uh, which is kind of the, a distraction because they have to shift focus from one monitor to another. There are also problems with expressivity because not always 
a structured report or a template has all the possible phrases, all the possible ways to express what is being visible in the image. So there must be uh, some space for, for the clinician to, to adjust the contents of the report when they need it. But also there are problems with the vocabularies, controlled vocabularies that might be used uh, for structured reporting, even though they, they are being uh, always de 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 developed, always getting better, they uh, still lack some of the vocabularies, wor wordings that are sometimes required to describe the state of the patient. Also, uh, by using structured reporting, we are able to create, uh, create documentation much faster, but being more productive, we can also um, like stimulate the production of bad medical documentation, uh, sometimes duplicating something that is already stated somewhere in the HR, uh, which uh, makes the problem of duplicate uh, re records uh, much more serious. Uh, but, uh, but of course, there are also benefits of this approach. Uh, when we have structured reporting deployed in the medical facility, we can standardize text uh, used by clinicians so they understand, understand each other. They know that this phrase means exactly this, so, so there is no ambiguity. Also, they can be automatically uh, translated into phrases understood, for instance, by, by patients, but also by other specialists. So they, the documents can contain a lot of explanations that could be too time consuming to include them in, in um, un, like classic unstructured uh, documentation. Also, uh, structured reports contain significantly more relevant information because of the uh, templates that guide doctors in a step-by-step -step manner to create uh, the, the report in a very precise way. And also this uh, lowers uh, the missing data rate because the software might control that certain things should always be analyzed when performing, like, uh, like when creating diagnostic reports. Also, they mentioned before, uh, productivity boost is very important from the perspective of structured reporting. And this is because of a simple fact, because uh, when you are a very proficient typer, and um, you can type on keyboard up to 300 characters per minute, which is the tempo of a programmer, which is who is very experienced. You can, of course, use speech recognition and become faster. You can then create up to 700 uh, characters per minute. But uh, when you are proficient at using structured reporting, you can become even faster and create up to 1,000 uh, characters per minute. So you become kind of three times faster comparing to the keyboard typing. Uh, but also from the data perspective, so these were those were like uh, from the clinical perspective. Now going to into data perspective, we uh, of course have this uh, standardized text uh, among radiologists. But having that, we can create uh, statistics automatically out of the documentation that we store, and we no longer have to look for ambiguities in the text. We focus on simple identifiers that can be concepts from some uh, standardized vocabulary, controlled uh, termin standardized terminology or controlled vocabulary like SNOMED CT or ICD-10 or 11. And having that foundation uh, of uh, strictly defined, very precise data uh, and encoded using standard um, uh, like um, vocabularies, we can uh, automate decision making uh, based on the contents of EHR, which is nowadays um, quite impossible because of the unstructured nature of, of the medical documentation and lacking information that we um, tend to look for in it. Uh, yes, this is uh, an image from actually an old paper. Uh, it's uh, from 2008. But uh, the authors of this uh, research like 
phrased, stated the ultimate quest for structured reporting. Because even, even then, like 15 years ago, uh, have observed that there are problems uh, of adaptation of structured reporting. Because it is very different in nature to what uh, clinicians are being used to. Uh, clinicians uh, tend to use like typing on keyboard or speech recognition to quickly phrase what they, accept, they expect so the report is being transcribed uh, to, to the con content uh, that they dictate. Uh, and having that, they do not focus uh, in any way on, on the structure of the, of the outcome. So uh, the authors of this uh, research um, uh, had the idea that uh, uh, the perfect uh, system for structured reporting can be designed in a way that doctors can uh, freeform dictate, so they can type, say anything or type anything, but the whole structuring happens automatically. So they do not uh, have to be even aware of it. Uh, the whole mm, difficult process of structuring is being done and by the software, uh, actually by, by artificial intelligence, but applied to, to text, not images that, that we are being used to. Um, we need uh, AI that acts on the text dictated or input uh, by uh, using any way by doctor. Um, and the, the techniques, uh, the AI techniques that are used for it have only now um, like been developed to, to be um, created to, to be used in a clinically viable way. Uh, because we need to extract a lot of knowledge from the doctor, from the clinician, but also we need to kind of guide them uh, to, to show them possible uh, alternatives or possible extension of what they say. So the software does not only allow for speech recognition, but also allows for extended input of something that the doctor would not think about uh, including originally, the software can suggest. Uh, and uh, the advancements in artificial intelligence allow for, for such uh, programs right now, because of, first of all, we have speech recognition that has decently uh, looking uh, results in terms of accuracy. Also, doctors can use like traditional approach to structure reporting, like drop down menus that select phrases, and also uh, based on the natural processing techniques, we can extract from typing, from unstructured text, the, the, the contents that uh, we expect uh, for, for structured report. So then, uh, having that, we might use human intelligence uh, to correct AI, because we can apply AI techniques to images. So they extract uh, from images things like uh, measurements, uh, like um, simple observations. And the doctors using natural uh, dictation or typing can correct uh, models in a way that uh, creates a feedback loop. So the models know what was wrong with their, with their diagnosis and uh, it, they could be retrained to include the, the like, uh, comments from, from the doctor. Uh, and uh, human intelligence can also extend AI in this portion of uh, uncommon cases, because when something uh, was uh, too difficult for, our AI, for AI to diagnose, it might state, okay, this is something that the doctor should uh, focus on. Um, yeah, we have, a we have a, an example of a report here that uh, kind of uh, is a Lirat's uh, scale. And we can see that uh, this report where it was generated automatically by AI and can be extended by uh, human intelligence to, to make it complete. And I will move on to the demo, how it can be done. I will use the liver reporting and data systems code, uh, data system called, called LIRAS. And it's standardized terminology, uh, standardizes terminology for uh, liver reporting 
actually uh, reduces uh, imaging interpretation variability and also errors and and uh, it has all the other benefits that we might expect from a structured uh, system but let me show you this i will move on to the demo we might uh, have an image that is being in the PAX system, but also we can have uh, those AI models that already analyzed the image. And when we move on to describing the contents of it, we can transform the output of uh, AI algorithms to text. So then when we when we have those like pieces of info, we have the like basis for the report. And this is fully generated by AI. But we can see that there are portions uh, of the report that are not checked. And we can see that, okay, the, in these places, there is, uh, in, this part, in these parts of documentation, there is place for human intelligence to fill in the gaps, to decide whether it is important to, uh, to include those observations because uh, sometimes we do not have to state full report of every, every single uh, thing. But in this case, we might see that, okay, in findings, and by analyzing the image, we might see, okay, we have found features of cirrhosis uh, and then an observation in series number three. We also have found that from the clinical information that there are uh, risk factors for HCC and this risk factor, uh, factor is cirrhosis. This was taken from EHR when it is uh, stated in, in a structured form. But as a doctor, I might uh, add, for instance, that uh, the AI the, didn't recognize that the tumor was in vain. And I might simply include this, this portion of the text to the report and make it, uh, first of all, decide whether this is something important from the perspective of a report. But of course, uh, then we, we might adjust in any way the contents when, when, the, when the problems with AI occur. Uh, and uh, things that are sometimes mundane, like, uh, like extracting uh, measurements, they also are performed by, by the AI. And uh, coming back to the slides uh, and summing up, actually, uh, we we can we can as you have seen we we can use AI first of all to automate those mundane tasks like measurements, uh, pre-fill reports using different models that are specialized for different um, like diagnostic purposes but also leaving uh, the, the place for human factor, for instance, for those uh, uncommon cases, but also um, to decide whether something should be included or not. Also, we, we uh, should always uh, take into account that uh, the quality of any AI system cannot be decoupled from people and organizations. We, uh, as people, have certain behaviors like uh, the, from choosing which application the, the data sets are used to interpreting the decisions are shaped by incentives and organizational context. So we always need to have to keep in, in mind that we embed our way of thinking into the models, not always the reality that we want to examine. And this is uh, actually a collaborative uh, task for the whole community we first of all need to create those uh, data sets which is a very difficult task but also train solutions on those data sets and having the dialogue between stakeholders uh, we need to like kind of define best practices for uh, for first of all creating those data sets labeling them and also training solutions on them to to use the full um, power of AI that uh, we already know uh, it has, but we need to um, create a process around. And thank you very much for, for the attention. I uh, will move to, to the Q&A session. Thank you very much for this very extensive and great overview of uh, 
a very structured presentation how we should be more structured in uh, our systems as well. So regarding to that human factor, um, there's a question. Uh, so Bastian Wermingoff is wondering if there's any scientific data for the comparison of speech recognition versus structured report with a comment that seems very generic in my point of view. Uh, yes, I might. Uh, this is something actually we observed uh, within our system, uh, but there, I have seen in the wild uh, such comparisons. Actually, uh, it is possible to uh, to generate to to kind of measure the differences between uh, doctors who dictate, because when you dictate, you often have to like say the whole phrase, but when you have suggestions for the doctors they simply need to find the location of them and they do not have to state it in, as a whole, simply click on it. But there is this problem, of course, of shifting, uh, for instance, mouse from one monitor to another. So this is, uh, yeah, depending on how you, <laughs> how you uh, create your uh, setup for diagnostics, you might uh, get better results. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that too, because obviously if you have a one click and it produces a lot of text and yes. that's a lot of characters, but actually I was wondering, I mean, in your experience, I, when I think about structured reporting, I always think it should be less text, right, than what we use to dictate. So actually I was wondering if, if like if that graphic is actually conveying the message, but what, what's your take on that? Uh, yes, uh, actually there are like, um... I would say that uh, from from yes, the, the, like the the assumption of structured reporting is to create uh, less text. But uh, I have also uh, like uh, observed that patients require the, the volume of text to be big because when there is there there is a lot of text, they feel kind of uh, more secure that each of the parts of the image was analyzed and a lot of work was performed. So. Uh, like from the clinical perspective, only the information that is important should be stated. But uh, yeah, there are also expectations uh, for, from the patient's world. I've seen that within uh, my clinic now that for certain trauma uh, that comes in, like for uh, cervical spine, for example, there's this structured report in which we do use. Uh, and then you have also, you know, the other, the other findings you can like deliver, be deliberate in. <laughs> but I think, yeah, um, it's interesting that patients have a different view on it because then you would say you have this list of a checklist that your doctor yes. has to check. Um, yes, but yeah, but, but, but like no information about, uh, like uh, about an organ. Mm -hmm. It has like two meanings, yes, whether the doctor has observed it, analyzed it, but decided not to describe it. Uh, yes. But there is this also second meaning of uh, the doctor not Yeah, and that's not really like this. also during the residency, even if you discuss those points, I mean, you notice that from different supervisors as well. And yeah. then you mentioned things and the one says like, it's good that you saw it, mention it and don't make big fuss out of it. And the other says, yeah, no, it's, yeah, this is normal. Just don't mention it. It was the yeah. same since 2017 onwards. So, uh, yeah, there's also yeah. in these, this interpretation, I guess, in general, um, which has a, some scale. Um, there's another question in the Q&A box from Samir Kumar Shah. Um, a non-specific term like presence of tumor in a vein in a case of um, hepatocellular carcinoma is acceptable? Can it be more specific, hepatic vein or portal vein? Well, probably yes, it could be more specific in terms, but yeah, it was only for the example that we could uh, like provide further details. We could of course get deeper, deeper into this concept uh, actually, when we look into the like um, controlled uh, terminologies like SNOMED CT, we have a whole hierarchy of, of concepts. Yes, you can be very strict, very detailed in what you uh, describe, but it has parent that is more general. Like, in, for instance, you have liver, 
which is an organ, which is in human body. And yeah, we, we always have this uh, balance. We need to keep this balance, whether we need to be very specific or we can go with the more general uh, approach in this situation. Yeah. I, yeah. I have a question regarding that because that's with structured reporting. That's always my question. And you have this tree of, yeah. I mean, terminology yeah. or like for different organs that you have your checklists or what is possible. And how further do you expand that tree? Like, when do you <laughs> yeah. stop? Yes, actually, I, I think this is the place for human intelligence. Yes, <laughs> um, because yes, we, we when we like um, create those AI models, then we as designers of them, like when we need to recognize something in the image, we find like snowman city concept that we train our solution for. And this is exactly this concept. But we as human beings, we have this flexibility. OK, maybe this concept should be uh, like um, included in the report, but having the whole context of the patient, maybe having the purpose of the examination, we might use this one because it will be more helpful for the, the recipient of the report. Yes, this is something that... Uh, also yeah. what you but take into account important. if you open, uh, of course, an exam in, you know, what kind of patient do I have in front of me? Uh, what kind of case is this? What is the question? Yes. And regarding to that, yeah, you already, already wire yourself towards your report. Yeah, I think actually just, uh, just sorry for interrupting, but just expanding on that, maybe as a general remark, I mean, that's actually like there's... Uh, a certain amount of human intelligence that needs to go into designing the template, right? So that you don't get lost in details, but kind of focus on, on the task at hand. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe just um, just uh, yeah, a remark from the audience that I think I would support 100% is that obviously Bastian Verminghoff, who, who had asked previously, is a clear fan of structured reporting, uh, but very often he says the end-to-end -end report process isn't very upfronts and standards are missing even with SNOMED, CT and RADLEX and so on. And that a loop of AI tools and kind of structured reporting will make the difference. And that's something that I definitely would, um, yeah, would support. And what I think, because that's something that I'm, I probably don't have much experience with, but with my brief context that I had with RADLEX and SNOMED and so on, I think some concepts are very, very detailed, but others seem to be missing for some reason. Is that your experience as well? Yes, yes. I think uh, also this is because of uh, human beings creating snowmen, and probably uh, this is only my like uh, guess. But probably snowmen city had specialists from this field that uh, they were in, in including concepts from those parts that are more detailed, whereas others uh, have like more general concepts that are still waiting for someone to 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 make them more precise. But actually, yes, the Summit City has those uh, mechanisms of uh, extending it. And it, as, as far as I know, uh, everyone can send some concepts to be included. So it is uh, like an open, open um, or edits uh, vocabulary. Yeah, maybe uh, another question that's coming in from Samir Kumar is um, like, do you have any guesses? I mean, you sh you show that interplay between structured reporting and AI. And so the question is, um, is there an average time taken for training an AI algorithm for reporting of an abdominal sonography report? Is that something that you have been working on at all? Uh, the training time? Yeah, I, I think that's what the question is referring to. Mm, no, I, I do not have uh, such uh, data. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I want to be guessing actually. It's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no worries. And, and then maybe another question coming from Samir Kumar. So obviously repeated manual measurements versus automate, automated measurements using AI and putting these reports, uh, it, these values in the report, what do you think is more accurate and less time consuming? Uh, like the different, uh, like first of all, putting in the report and then correcting, right? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, correcting those uh, inputs is very informative for, for the AI, yes, because first of all, it stated something, but then the feedback from, from the doctor 
uh, is that okay there should be this actually value for for this field i think uh, it might be sometimes uh, it might take longer actually to to correct ai but it has this like uh, long term benefit of re retraining Right. Um, just one question, maybe before I will hand back to Pinar, sorry for uh, kind of being uh, on so much. Um, which is, I was wondering, I mean, one thing that maybe speaks to that as well and that you you, say, you you spoke about is that integration of, you know, structured reporting within all the, of those other systems, be it measurements coming in or even maybe a, a specific field triggering, I don't know, some push notification to another system and then things going along and so on. Is there, is there, do you have any experience with that where you kind of, have you seen such integrations? Because that's something that I'm always wondering if, if we really kind of get the systems to speak to each other to some extent. Yes, uh, like in order to, from my experience, there is a lot of problem, not maybe adhering to the standards by being open to use them actually, because uh, like this is uh, coming from the software vendors uh, world they have a lot of uh, incentives to keep the data uh, closed, like uh, do, do not share it. And uh, this is more around like the culture to, that needs to change. And those software vendors need to like um, kind of uh, restructure their, their model in order uh, for that to happen. Because when, when they have incentive to keep the data closed, the, we want to be able to to you know, to create solutions that are interoperable, interoperable. but there are examples of uh, systems. Uh, some of them uh, were forced by by governments to, to open their data sets the, to provide APIs, uh, actually in the US, and for for parts of of the uh, uh, electronic records that they store, and they have to like. Uh, need to have to have APIs that different external software vendors can interact with. And they have app stores where uh, the independent uh, companies can uh, submit uh, extensions to the EHR and the integration is happening then um, in a pretty straightforward way. But yeah, but those systems had to be forced in order to be open like that. But uh, eventually they, they still have a lot of customers. They didn't die because of sharing data. So uh, yeah, there is, this is a living proof that we, we might be able to be open in terms of sharing income records. You already mentioned uh, uh, some things for uh, others the last minute. Uh... Let's re also answer this last question from uh, how much cost does it add per report, especially in a developing country like India? Uh, structured reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So uh, from our uh, analysis, uh, like uh, when, when there is a pr quite proficient radiologist, it adds like uh, 25 cents uh, to per report. Oh, nice. So it's already much. like there's this cost uh, effectiveness, uh, of course, already known. Um, and then there's a comment by uh, Bastian uh, Ramenhoff. Have a look at DeepSea and independent AI platform. I think we already had a webinar also call for uh, the attendees to go back and check out that webinar with Deep DeepSea. Uh, so for my question, my last question, you already mentioned a few things of um, what should or could be done let's put a thin line between that uh, and i want to get back to your last line in the summary uh, sheet call to action for the community so what is your call like if you would have a few bullet points which we should take home what is your call for our community <laughs> yes actually yes there's a lot of sp space for structure reporting uh, there is a lot of space for different uh, software vendors of, of those systems. Uh, there, we, we also need the, this uh, openness of, of existing EHR systems to uh, either exchange the information, but because we can build upon the data foundation from them, extend it 
and actually re like uh, send it back. Yes, yeah? so they they will eventually receive the documentation, but in the form they expect, having yes. the whole structure around around it, and yeah, having those possibilities to uh, reuse the data that we gather from patients. Yeah, I think this you per, like portrayed a great loop uh, in there in how uh, yeah to improve and uh, yeah a step yeah, forward I, I guess. Yeah, um, and I think it's a very beautiful call to action, like yes. the open and <laughs> integrate <laughs> things, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think for now we had a lot of great questions, and I don't have any questions anymore, Daniel. You. No, I, I think that was excellent. Thanks. Uh, yes, it was very. It was a very nice webinar, uh, and, and we had some great interaction. Thank you very much for uh, joining us and giving this great talk. And looking forward to see you in the future again. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again uh, this evening uh, or morning or uh, whatever time zone we are in. Uh, we look forward to seeing you during our next webinar and please don't forget our annual uh, meeting which will be in Valencia this year the 14th and 15th of October. If you have any abstracts please send them in we will uh, love to receive them uh, and evaluate them and hope to see you all live in uh, Valencia. Yeah. Have a great day and a great week and talk okay. soon. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.